This is Climate Positive, a show featuring candid conversations with the leaders, innovators, and changemakers driving our climate positive future. I'm Chad Reed. I'm Hillary Langer. And I'm Gil Jenkins. A life economy is built on a supposition that the goal should be to maximize benefits for all life long term and pays people to clean up pollution, to regenerate destroyed environments, to recycle, to develop new technologies that don't ravage the earth. And we've been on a pattern of making that happen. On this week's episode, our guest is Mr. John Perkins, the activist and author of numerous books on global intrigue, shamanism, and ecological transformation, including Touching the Jaguar and the classic Confessions of an Economic Hitman. John and I began the interview by talking about his earlier life as an economic hitman, including his profound awakening on the evils of this work and how that subsequently led him on his journey to becoming a crusader for transforming our failing death economy, which destroys its own resources and nature itself, into a flourishing life economy that renews itself. In our conversation, John shares a simple exercise in the form of five key questions we can all ask ourselves to shift our perceptions and move towards this life economy, as he describes it. We also discuss the broader Living Earth Movement, which was started around a righteous call for the U.S. and China to work together on climate. John's next book, due in February 23, focuses on this relationship. Lastly, we found time to discuss Russia's war on Ukraine and how that has dramatically changed geopolitical dynamics with a particular focus on energy and climate. I think you'll find this to be a very thought-provoking conversation with a very wise and dedicated human being. As a longtime fan of Confessions, it was a great honor and a pleasure to sit down with John. Climate Positive is produced by Hannon Armstrong, a leading investor in climate solutions for over 30 years. To learn more about our Climate Positive journey, please visit hannonarmstrong.com. John, welcome to Climate Positive. It's really nice to meet you. Thanks, Gil. It's great to be here with you. I'm really looking forward to this. So your book, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, was a deeply engaging and eye-opening text that's really stayed with me for many years now since I was a college student and first read it at UMass, I think, 15 years ago. Today, we're going to talk a lot about climate and ecological civilization. But to start, for our listeners who may not be familiar with Confessions of an Economic Hitman, could you give a brief synopsis of how that came to be and what you talked about in such riveting depth in your book? You mean, what does an economic hitman do? That's right. We might as well define it first and then share how you came to be one. I think it's uh, fair to say that we economic hitmen have been the front line of the march to expand what we are calling today a death economy, an economic system that's failing us, that's consuming itself into extinction. And it's the global economic system today that we must change. It is the cause of climate change and income inequality, species extinction. So many of the crises that we face, they're not the problem, they are problems. But the problem (laughs) is the economic system that underlies all of that. My official title was chief economist at a Boston consulting firm. I I had up to 50 people working for me at various times. My job was to identify countries that had resources that corporations covet, like oil, and then arrange a huge loan to that country from the World Bank or one of its sister organizations. The money, however, n- did not ever go to the country that had the loan on its book, that had the debt on its books. It, the money went instead to our own corporations, the Bechtels, or Halliburton's, or General Electric's, or Brown and Roots, or Stone and Webster's, that built big infrastructure projects in those countries. Things like electric power systems, ports, airports, highways, industrial parks. These were things that brought huge profits <laughs> to our companies, the ones that built them. And they benefited a few wealthy people in the country, uh, the people who own the industries, who own the banks, who own the commercial establishments. But as it turned out, and I didn't understand this for a while, I have to say I thought I was doing the right thing for a number of years until I came to understand that the majority of the people in the country were actually suffering because money was diverted from health, education, and other social services to pay off the interest on the loans. And in the end, we'd go back and say, hey, since you can't pay your loans, which in the end, they couldn't pay the principal, you're basically our slave, you know, like let our corporations exploit your oil or whatever resource we were looking at. 
without many environmental or social restrictions or regulations. Let us build a military base on your soil. You know, vote with us on the next United Nations vote against Cuba. Or things like this, where we really, it was a colonialistic policy. It was very difficult for leaders of a country, the president or the finance minister, whoever I was talking to, to refuse because they knew that if they accepted these loans, they and their family and their friends would, would get rich. They own the industries. And in addition to some minor types of bribery that would be going on, uh, they also would benefit from these projects. And they also knew that, that behind me stood people we call jackals. And these are really CIA assets. Assassins, right. Yes, yeah. They, yeah, people that either assassinate leaders or overthrow governments. Whoever is listening who has not read this book, it will change you. And you've updated it many times, or at least a few times since. New confessions, I think. But this was a big decision for you, obviously, to you know put your life in danger in some respects to reveal this work. I think you've talked about a kind of a, a moment where it all hit you. Could you share that story when you decided to take this book out into the world? Yeah. After 10 years, I realized what the truth behind what we were really doing. I, I quit and I wanted to devote the rest of my life to turning things around, to, to, to transforming this death economy we were creating into what we call a life economy. And so I started writing a book. And I wanted to write it as an expose, so I contacted other people who had jobs or who had had jobs like mine, and the jackals, also a few jackals who I personally knew. And I immediately received anonymous phone calls threatening my life and my infant daughters. And I took the calls very seriously because I knew these guys. I knew what they could do. And at the same time, one night I get taken out to dinner by the president of Stone and Webster uh, Engineering Company. It was one of the biggest, if not the biggest, engineering construction company in the United States at the time. And the president took me out to dinner and he said, you know, you've got a great resume. You were chief economist at one of our rival companies. Uh, we'd like to use your resume in our proposals. You, you won't have to do any work for us. Uh, just let us use your resume. And I'm prepared to write you a check tomorrow morning for $500,000. Well, Gil, this was the late 80s. You know, half a million is nothing to laugh at today, but it was, <laughs> it was even more no about that. <laughs> and then he said, just don't write the book. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> you know, it was interesting uh, because now I'm getting hit by a hitman. You know, it's the same thing I had told presidents of countries, you know, like, hey, you know, buy my deal and you make a lot of money or don't. <laughs> and yeah, the assassins will be there. Well, you know, what would you do? I took the money. And in self-defense, I would say I, I didn't go out and buy fast cars or fancy yachts or big house or anything like that. I, I went back to the Amazon where I'd been a Peace Corps volunteer before I became a chief economist at, right after college. And I began writing books about what was going on in the Amazon and the indigenous people. And these were not books that, that attacked the system I'd been part of at all. They were just, they were kind of fun books about shamanism and the Amazon. And Stone Webster was fine with me doing that. And in addition to the retainer of half a million dollars, they also paid me a monthly stipend, a pretty good one. So I, I wrote those books. But then on 9 11, now my contract with Stone Webster had expired some years earlier. 9-11, I'm in the Amazon. I formed nonprofits that to help the indigenous people and to teach our people something called dream change and eventually the Pachamama Alliance, which I'm a co-founder of. And I was in the Amazon on 9-11 and afterwards I flew up to Ground Zero in New York. And as I looked into that pit, I knew I had to write this book. Wow. And I decided though that I wouldn't tell anybody I was writing it. I wouldn't put myself in that position. I would write it as a confession, a personal story, not an expose. And, and I wouldn't tell anybody I was writing it until I had it completed and in the hands of a very good agent in New York. And he would have it in the hands of publishers, which I thought would be my best insurance policy. Let's come back to your time in the Amazon and another theme that you alluded to, how we can begin to transition into a flourishing life economy by changing our perception. At its most basic, fundamental level, your your time working with shamans. Tell us about what you learned, what you wrote about, 
and how you came to this concept of the death economy and the life economy. When I was in the Peace Corps, before I became an economic hitman, right after graduating from college, I'm living deep in the Amazon rainforest with an indigenous group known as the Shuar, where I still, and I'm on my way to visit them again. I take a group of people there in a couple of weeks. I go every year, continue to, for all these years. This was back in 1968. I, I went to the Amazon, and as I'm living with these people, I, at one point I get very, very sick. I couldn't keep any food down. I was dying. I lost a tremendous amount of weight in no time. And it was a three-day horrendous endeavor to try to get out of those forests and up into the Andes to any kind of medical facility. I couldn't do it. I couldn't even stand up. So I was resigned to dying. And then one night, the school teacher, who was the one person I could communicate with, he spoke Spanish. And I, my Spanish was not real good, but I spoke some. <laughs> and, and everybody else spoke yeah. schwa. He comes by and he introduces, he says, I want to introduce you to the guy who can make you healthy. And this little old schwa shaman, I didn't know, I never heard the word shaman at that time, but he's quite small, but very strong and wiry, and he's naked except for a loincloth covered with tattoos. And you're near death at this point? Yes, I, can't, okay. I cannot stand up and walk on my own. Wow. So that night, uh, he takes me on a shamanic journey, and he's chanting, and he's in the middle of the night in the rainforest. And at one point, I'm, I'm in this trance, and I, I have my eyes closed, and, and I see this amorphous shape in front of me. And the shaman, this is all done through a translator, the, the school teacher, the shaman says, touch the jaguar. And I'm like, I open my eyes, it's what? the middle of the night, yeah. in the middle of the jungle, and I'm looking all around, it. there are jaguars in this jungle, I hear them at night, like, where's the jaguar? And he says, no, 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 close your eyes and see the jaguar. And I close my eyes, and the, the amorphous form shape shifted into a, a jaguar, and I touched it. And when I touched it, I saw that the food and drink I'd been consuming while living with the schwa, every time I ate or drank this, I hear a voice like my mother saying, it'll kill you. In the Amazon, people don't drink water from the rivers because the rivers have organic matter, dead animals. Animals have died. Uh, trees have fallen and rotted and so forth. The women make a kind of beer by chewing and, and spitting manioc root, and it ferments and sets up a kind of beer, and then you can add water to it. you got to drink a lot of this stuff because you've got to rehydrate. It's the, you know, sure. the tropics. And there wasn't any Perrier, you know? And... <laughs> So I see that every time I eat squirming white grubs or I drink spit beer, I hear this voice saying, it'll kill you. At the same time, I saw how incredibly robust the schwa are. People live to be very old if they're not killed in a hunting accident or something like that. And so I saw on this shamanic journey that it was not the food and drink that were killing me. It was my mindset, my perception this perception had been drilled into me since I was a boy growing up in New Hampshire, where we ate very mild <laughs> foods. And after that, I was get healthy very quickly. The shaman then came back and he, he demanded that as payment, I become his apprentice. And since 1969, I'd never heard of a shaman. I'd graduated from business school. There was no future in shamanism in those days. But the guy saved my life. So I did. And one of the first things he taught me was Whenever you, there's something that's holding you back or causing a problem in you, you've got to touch the jaguar. Touch it. Understand it. Don't run from it. you got to touch it. And when you touch it, you can ask for a perception change. And when you change perception, you change reality. Now, this sounds very sophisticated, but these people, are they're called a dream culture. And they totally believe in the dream, not just the nighttime dream, they're big on that, but they also believe in the dream of perception, that as you perceive things, you create things. And he instilled that in me. And of course, I later studied with shamans in many other countries, in, in Indonesia and Iran and Egypt and all over Latin America. And I found this to be true everywhere. And I also came to understand that this is the basis of modern psychotherapy. And reality, we know that there's no United States, there's no China. There's no corporations, yep. there's no religion, there's no culture until we perceive it. And when enough people accepted perception or codified into law, it has a huge impact on reality. And that's what gives us hope today about transforming a death economy into a life economy. Okay, the good segue. 
define the contours of the death economy, which which we're in, is being exacerbated, and the green shoots you see on the potential to shift towards a life economy. Yeah, a death economy is based on the premise that the goal for Corporations should be to maximize short-term profits, regardless of the social and environmental cost. And that was really very, very strongly put forward. in Milton Friedman, right? Yeah, 1976. Yeah. Friedman won the Nobel Prize in economics. Before that, as a business school student, before that, I'd been taught that, yeah, you need to make profits, but a good CEO also takes good care of his employees and his customers yeah. and his suppliers and the communities where his businesses are located. That was part of my education in business school. But there was a growing movement that emphasized maximization of profits. And Friedman really topped off that movement in 76 when he won the Nobel Prize. And he was an influential person around the world with Reagan and Thatcher and many others. And so that's the basis. And what it's created is an economic system where CEOs believe that they not only can, but have to do whatever it takes to maximize short-term profits. And that includes destroying the environment, it includes exploiting workers, exploiting resources. It includes bribing politicians and includes making bribery legal, which we know now in the corporations and their stockholders have a huge legal influence well, through their donations. Dark money and alike with Citizens United, that corporations are yeah. people. So this death economy is one that's consuming itself into extinction in the short run that doesn't care about the long run. I mean, we're seeing an incredible example of that right now with people like Biden and many others who are pro doing things that will stop climate change against yeah. fossil fuels. But now we're finding themselves in a position where in the short run, they have to promote fossil fuels. They have to go to Saudi Arabia and try to get the Saudis to produce more oil and gas just to keep the economy running. And that's a dilemma that we have. And I, I'm not faulting Biden or anybody else for doing that. It's, it's a very, very difficult position these people are in. But it is destroying us, and it's creating most of the crises that we're currently facing today on this planet. A life economy, on the other hand, is built on a supposition that the goal should be to maximize benefits for all life long term, long term benefits for all life. And pays people to clean up pollution, to regenerate destroyed environments, to recycle, to develop new technologies that don't ravage the earth. And we've been on a pattern of making that happen. Benefit corporations, yep. the Green New Deal, conscious capitalism, there's been a, a real movement in, in this direction and, and it's been somewhat put on hold by both the pandemic and the invasion of Ukraine and, the, and, and all the crises that have resulted from those events. But we've been on that, that movement. It's our only hope in the long term. And I understand in your new book, you've got a sort of 10 minute consciousness exercise that people can do to sort of get in touch with shifting that perception. And could you talk a little bit about that exercise? You know, we all know there's a lot of things we can do to move into this life economy. We can, you know, cut back on fossil fuel production. We can be very conscious of what we buy and what we eat and so on and so forth. In addition to that, I think every one of us, because we're all different individuals, we've all got different goals, but we can all ask ourselves five questions. And in the book, the new book coming out, I, I go into some detail behind this. So I, I still encourage people <laughs> to read the book, but I'm going to give you those questions right now and a couple of examples. So number one, what is it I most want to do for the rest of my life? What will give me the greatest satisfaction? And for me, I, the example, I would answer, I want to write. I love to write. I have a friend who's a carpenter and his answer is, I want to work with my hands in wood, the opposite end of the spectrum kind of, you know? The second question is, how do I do this in a way that transforms the death economy to a life economy? I would answer just by saying, I will write books that inspire people to do that. And my carpenter friend would say, I will only use sustainable materials uh, to build houses and cabinets and everything else. The third question is, what's the jaguar that's standing in your way that's keeping you from doing this? Uh, what's the yes. obstacle? 
And for me, a writer might say, well, I don't have time to write every day. And I know I need to write every day if I'm really going to write be a writer. But I don't have time. And my carpenter friend would say, well, my clients say, you know, I don't want to pay the extra price for sustainable materials. And the fourth question is, when you touch that Jaguar, <laughs> what happens? How do you change your perception? And as a writer, I'd say, well, wait, the Jaguar is telling me, hey, you could turn off the television for an hour four nights a week and write, <laughs> or maybe five nights or maybe two hours. And for my carpenter friend, the Jaguar says, hey, tell your clients that the extra price, if there is one, is not a cost. It's an investment. They're investing in the future for themselves and their children by using sustainable materials. And then the fifth question is, what actions do I take right now? And for a writer, it's like, well, I gotta, I gotta write. <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta start writing. I gotta write every day or four days a week or something. And the, the carpenter says, well, I gotta start using these sustainable materials. And I gotta tell my clients and their kids, hey, look, your parents built this, this bookcase here with sustainable materials, and they built this house with sustainable materials because they're investing in your future. And so I think no matter what you are, a podcast host, a, a plumber, a teacher, a construction worker, a philosopher, whatever you are, you can ask yourself these questions and we can all take different paths, but let's go for the same destination of, of creating a, a life economy. I want to tell you about another podcast you might enjoy. There are trillions of dollars flowing into climate solutions. The world's largest energy firms, tech companies, and banks are putting big dollars behind climate tech. So where is a smart investment going? Catalyst, with Shale Khan, offers an authoritative guide to how we address climate change across the global economy. Hosted by veteran analyst and investor Shale Khan, Catalyst digs deep into climate and climate tech solutions with the world's top experts and helps us understand the trends that are reshaping the economy and transforming the way we power our lives. Listen and follow Catalyst wherever you get your podcasts. I want to talk a little bit about the living earth movement as a natural segue, which maybe you said it, but you know, you can't make any money on a dead planet. So your criticisms of capitalism, and there's a lot of criticism of capitalism, are directed more towards what you call predatory capitalism. But capitalism itself isn't the evil. It's just the perversion of it and how it's led us down this path towards climate destruction. But let me ask you about the Living Earth Movement, which is a collection of leaders in the fields of theology, business, science, activism, and academia who are passionate about combating climate change and preserving life as we know on the planet. I know you're working with Dr. John Cobb on this, but how did you get involved with this particular movement? And then I'm going to ask you more about your book and U.S.-China relationship. Yeah, they kind of tie together because John Cobb is just celebrated his 97th birthday, and he's very eloquent. He's a remarkable thinker and philosopher and human being, and he's been extremely influential in China as well as in the United States. He is a process theologian. He, he promotes process philosophy, and I think there's 36 institutions in China that he's formed around that over the years. And I got involved with him because I was working on this book about China and the United States, and uh, I knew that he had very good contacts. So I, I became part of the Living Earth Movement, which was formed around him. And at this point in history, it's, it's not so much as a, of a movement as a discussion amongst people, which is hopefully leading to a movement. But John Cobb last year wrote a very short, concise, incredibly eloquent, powerful letter to both Presidents Xi of China and Biden of the United States, pleading with them to come together to end climate change. And he said, you know, you guys can disagree on everything else. <laughs> you can disagree on politics, you can disagree on Taiwan and, and Afghanistan and, and on and on, but please agree that nobody lives on a dead planet. And he sent this letter off, and he had good contacts, people very close to Xi in China, and he also was very close to Biden's priest in his Catholic church outside Washington, D.C., and the priest said he would personally hand the letter to Biden. So there's every reason to believe both of these leaders get the letter, but within about a month after that is when they had their virtual 
conference, the two of them got together and talked about this. So we don't know for sure that that happened because of the letters, but maybe, maybe the letters had some influence. The point being, the letters were extremely elegant and they emphasized the incredible need of these two countries to come together. And you, we know today that China has basically outdone the United States, that their economic hitmen have, have learned from our, the successes and failures of our economic hitmen, and people like me. And they today are the number one trading partner and the number one investor on in every continent in the world, including North America. And our two countries provide about almost 50%, I think it's 47% of the world's GDP, and, and about an equal amount of the world's pollution, especially carbon dioxide. So if these two countries can't agree to end this insanity that we're on of the creating climate change, we're doomed. Why do you think it does seem so paradoxical for anybody to say we should be working with China on anything? There's the, the saber rattling. The, um, we're almost in a cold war. You know, Biden has continued the trade war with China. Politicians on both sides of the party regularly are upping tensions, and we see what's happening in Taiwan. I agree with you, and this is the most existential threat of our time, and it doesn't work with the two largest economies and the two largest emitters not getting together. So I applaud you for talking about this differently, because the whole other conversation in China is not about this. It's about suppressing them and winning. Well, it's particularly true, I think, in the United States that the politics, in a way, dictates that anybody who wants to be elected or stay elected and to high offices in the United States has to have an enemy. And right now the enemy is China and it's also become Russia recently. And of course, this is an attempt to, to align the two strongly with each other. And they are somewhat aligned, but not as strongly, I, I think, as, as our politicians would like us to believe. I've spent a lot of time talking with Chinese people. I taught in an MBA program in Shanghai to Chinese students. Uh, and I did not find this to be as true in China. And I, I think that's changing now a little bit, too, because I, I think they, because the United States has been so aggressive in, in making China the enemy that it's it's put Xi in a position and, and other leaders in China. So Xi has about seven top people that he kind of reports to. He's not the all-powerful leader that we all think he is. He is powerful. But it's not what right. the Americans are, are led to believe, that this guy is like some sort of a Hitler-type, all-powerful leader. He's not. He, he's got a very strong faction that opposes him, a very powerful family that opposes him, that he has to be very aware of. Anyway, when I was teaching in China, uh, these young students, uh, MBA students, who were singled out, they were members of the Communist Party, they'd been singled out to be the future leaders of China. and. One after another, I heard them say, you know, we've grown up with terrible pollution. We haven't been able to breathe the air in our cities, drink the water and, and so forth. We don't want that for our kids. We've created an economic miracle. They said, you know, since the mid-70s, China has brought almost 800 million people out of dire poverty. It had 10% on average economic growth for 30 years. No other country has done anything like this. And they would say this, the students, they'd say, we, we created an economic miracle. And it came at a terrible cost environmentally and socially. But we felt that cost. We've been part of, we've been on the receiving end of that cost. And we don't want it anymore. We don't want it for our kids. And so we've proven we can create a miracle. So now we're going to create a green miracle. And, you know, I, I think they really believed that. And I don't know, you know, whether they'll be able to do it or not, but I think they really felt the urgency. In the United States, our students also say similar things. I've taught a lot of it and spoken at a lot of MBA programs and other universities here. And I always, in all of these cases, I try to get together at least for an hour or two with a, a group of students at each college that I go to and, and talk to them about these issues. And well, not more than anything, hear what they have to say, because they're going to hear what I say at my lecture. And, you know, I hear this concern now. I didn't hear it very much after Confessions was first published in 2004, but I'm hearing it more and more. But a major difference is that for us, it's relatively intellectual, which is important. It's, it's an important, it's being spoken right. about all, you're talking about, everybody's talking about climate change. 
but we haven't experienced the kind of degradation. We haven't, ha other than a you know, few pockets like the LA area for a short period of time, relatively short period of time, we haven't experienced the kind of terrible pollution that the Chinese students have experienced. So it's not quite as immediate. And I find that interesting. But I do find that in both places, there's an understanding that we've got to change. And I also find this, of course, throughout Europe, Latin America, Africa, <laughs> everywhere, people are waking up. There's a consciousness revolution. We're waking up to the fact that we can't keep going the way we're going. But we've got to figure out how to come together to stop this. And a key to that building that bridge is, is building the bridge between China and the United States, at least on this one issue. Let's stay on geopolitics a bit. What are your thoughts on Russia's war on Ukraine and how that's changed so much, but maybe with a particular focus on energy and climate, given our show and the acute nature of that? Yeah, it's a terrible tragedy. You know, it's outrageous. It is it's no other way to express that and whether you can look back at history and say Putin was pushed into it or whatever you can say about all of that and some of it's maybe true or may not be I don't know but the point is that it's it's outrageous what's happening today and it's causing immense immense problems around the world you know it's it's causing as we all know horrible food shortages yep. throughout so many countries and shortages of fertilizer and and other things. And it's also distracted us from the real important issue before us of, of survival on this planet, of, of moving from a death economy to a life economy, getting out of stopping, cl reversing climate change. So in the case of Russia, I think that invasion has just been a, an incredibly difficult distraction, as well as the horrible tragedy of what's happening in Ukraine and the implications of where that might go next. Yeah, it's hard to say there might be a silver lining from something that is still an ongoing, horrifying tragedy. But in some sense, do you think that the realization that maybe we don't want to be dependent on petro states and their whims and global oil markets and energy security and what that could mean for speeding the transition over the midterm and long term, just another reason in addition to climate change, but also that energy and national security, at least in Europe, I'm, I'm not so sure in the US, I wish it was more of a tailwind. Yeah, I, I agree with you. you know, and I think that it's driving the, the nail into the coffin of fossil fuels. But <laughs> It's a slowly yeah. pounding hammer that's driving that nail. And in the <laughs> short run, it, the hammer's kind of pulled a little bit of the nail out where it was driving it. It's pulled some of that out now in the, for the short run. Let's hope it's just the short run. But I, I can't imagine that Europe isn't going to come out of this understanding that it can't be so dependent on Russian oil and gas. And I can't imagine that the United States isn't going to come out of this uh, realizing that it can't be so dependent on Saudi Arabia and other places in the Middle East and, and other places, and, it, and that we just can't be dependent on oil and gas. I, I can't imagine that that is not going to change. But what's the short run? Well, that, to a large degree, depends on what happens in Ukraine and with Russia and where Russia goes from here. And I also, I think it's really important for people to recognize that the green economy is very, very dependent on China. Another reason for coming together with China. China controls most of the world's lithium and a lot of the cobalt and many of the other minerals that are absolutely necessary to solar and wind and other aspects of the green economy. China controls them and it makes most of the solar panels. And that part may change. We can develop factories here and, from, and microchips, the same thing. But China controls the, the mines that mine these. Are we going to find more mines? Well, maybe. But perhaps the more logical and more immediate solution is let's work with China to make sure that we build this bridge that will enable all of us around the world to move increasingly toward non-fossil fuels, toward green energy and green transportation and green everything else, <laughs> organic foods and local production and so on and so forth. There's a long list there, and we need to take all of this very, very seriously. 
Let's turn to the portion that we call our, our hot seat. So I read that your parents were both teachers. So I have to ask, what's the best lesson each of them taught you? Values, uh, the value of, of love, the value of life. You know, they were people who had a hard time. We lived, lived in New Hampshire, very rural areas. They had to sometimes kill insects and ants and things in the garden. They had a hard time doing that. You know, I grew up really valuing life and realizing that, that times for, you know, we, you have to make exceptions. I think they taught me amazing values. They taught me that money doesn't buy happiness. They were teachers in a, in a boys' private school. My dad made almost no money. The, the a house was given to us by the school. They took care of everything, <laughs> all the plumbing, electricity, food. I ate in the boys' uh, dining room from the time I was four years old, all my meals, you know, f free food, healthy food. But we didn't have much money, and I was taught very early in life that money just doesn't buy you happiness. And and I think that was really important. I think that helped me. I think one of the reasons I was able to stop being an economic hitman, get out of that business where I was making a lot of money and traveling first class around the world, living what I thought was the American dream, living what had been my dream growing up in rural New Hampshire. Oh, my God, I, I can't believe I'm you know hanging out with presidents of countries and traveling first class, but. At some point, this value system clicked in. So that was very important teaching from them, as well as the love of literature. They also taught me the love of literature and how powerful the written word is. So on literature, what are the books in your life that have meant the most to you? <laughs> oh, my gosh. I, I tend to think very much in the short run right now. And I, I recently uh, read a book called uh, The Most Beautiful Girl in Cuba. And it was about the fight for independence against Spain in the late 1800s and William Randolph Hearst and how how important the perception was. It says Hearst was trying to, you know, use this example of this woman, this, what he called the most beautiful woman in Cuba, who was put in prison in Cuba by the Spaniards to incite America to enter the war. And it's a powerful book because <laughs> it tells so much about what my life was about, you know, many years later. So yeah. that's an important book. I, I love Graham Greene's The Power and the Glory. There's been a lot of, lot of books. You cannot beat Shakespeare's Macbeth. I mean, that's the ultimate story <laughs> of the works. economic hitman, you know, and the jackal all rolled into one. Yeah. Yes. How do you connect with nature personally? I live on this island that's got beautiful forests. And I go into them almost every day. I usually jog. I like to jog, but I don't like to jog on asphalt. I jog on, you know, forest uh, dirt. <laughs> and then I go to New Hampshire and where I grew up. I spend a couple of months there every year in August and September after I get out of the Amazon. I go there and I go to the Amazon. And of course. So I love to get out into nature. But when I'm in a city or someplace where I, I can't do that, even sitting in a in an apartment or a hotel room 50 stories up, or 30 stories up or whatever, I'll feel that these walls are all built out of nature. This chair comes from nature. Everything comes from nature. And, and I go into that. It's all the elements. And I'll do a little meditation. You know, I go, Nature is just everywhere, and it's within us. So I'm connecting with it constantly, frankly. What gives you hope today? Young people, people I mentioned in colleges in the United States, in Latin America, in Europe, in China. I also uh, spent time in Russia in 2017 before this invasion. And uh, I was speaking on the same stage as Putin, in fact, at a big economic conference and hanging out with people there that, that I felt that were the Russian people. So I feel around the world there's a consciousness revolution. There's an awakening. And, you know, Whenever there's a revolution, there's always pushback. The status quo tries to stop it. But good revolutionaries or agents of change use that, take energy from that. So I've practiced martial arts most of my life. And as a martial artist, I know that if I'm up against someone who's bigger and stronger than me, I can't try to overpower him. I got to use his energy against him, you know, turn it around. And that's what revolutionaries do with those who push back. And I think we're at a time right now where everybody in the world, or most everybody in the world, is waking up. A lot of people, and let's say a lot of people are waking up. And there's also this strong pushback by the status quo. 
but we've been on a pattern of moving forward to, toward change. And we've had a bit of a setback now with the invasion of, of Ukraine, as we've talked about. But I think we're still on that pattern. That gives me hope. And I get hope from these young people I talk with all over the world. Last question. Finish the phrase. To me, climate positive means? Transforming the death economy into a life economy. Moving away from this idea of maximizing short-term economic benefits, short-term materialism, short-term profits, to maximizing long-term benefits for all life. Wonderful. John, thank you so much for coming on our show. My pleasure, Gil. Climate Positive is produced by Hannon Armstrong. If you enjoyed this week's podcast, please leave us a rating and a review on Apple or Spotify, which really helps us get more listeners. You can also let us know what you thought via Twitter at ClimatePosiPod or email us at ClimatePositive at HannonArmstrong.com. I'm Gil Jenkins, and this is Climate Positive.